I was thinking uh, a lot today about the cross of Christ and uh, just, we sing songs like this, that it is finished. And we think of the statement of Jesus from the cross, it is finished, it is done. And I want to point out that what's so beautiful about God, what's so beautiful about Jesus is that Abraham, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter four, Abraham was saved by faith just like you and I are saved by faith. Hey, there we go. Abraham was saved by faith just like you and I are saved by faith. Abraham was declared righteous by his faith. Daniel declared righteous through faith. These people of the Old Testament declared righteous by faith. And at this point in, in linear, kind of a linear history, Jesus hadn't died yet. Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead yet. Sin hadn't been overthrown. And, and yet their, their faith was in God and God's provision for salvation and that God was going to make men whole, that he was going to make mankind and rescue them and redeem them from their sin to a new life. It is beautiful to me that everyone who has ever put faith in God has put faith in God for the same thing, salvation, for life, for righteousness, for redemption, and that you and I are in great company um, through history, through the pages of history, the pages of the scripture, we are in great company of those who name the name of God as the source of all righteousness. Last week we talked about the Gospels, or we at least started talking about the Gospels. This week we'll finish that conversation. Uh, obviously we're not going to go through the entirety of the books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but we do want to address kind of some topics. So last week we talked about how the Gospels are not written as the introduction to the Christian story, but that the Gospels are written as, uh, as a semi-quasi-conclusion to the Jewish story, that the Gospels are part of the Jewish narrative uh, before they're part of the Christian narrative. And what I mean by that is we tend to read the Gospels and we tend to read the story of Jesus' birth and Jesus' uh, death and resurrection and all the miracles that he did in the meantime. We kind of read those as, look at what Jesus is saying to us. And we kind of read them with our 21st century Western church culture kind of view. Instead of saying, I'm going to read these according to the Jewish tradition that they were taught in. Jesus was a Jew. He came to the Jews. He ministered to the Jews that, uh, that he was God, that he was the Savior. And, and so we need to understand these in this way. The Bible... That was weird. The Bible needs not... The Bible does not need to be confusing... Okay, the Bible is confusing simply because it's got a lot of pages and we feel overwhelmed when we're reading it. But the Bible itself isn't teaching a complicated message. It does get a little bit complicated when we try to make it about us, when we try to make it something that is talking about who we are or what we're supposed to do. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples. I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to begin in verse 13, verses that are very familiar. Uh, I have traveled and preached for about 22 years. These were theme verses at so many different camps and retreats. Pierce is traveling and preaching more and more. Obviously, at some point, he's going to get invited to preach on Matthew 5, 13 through 16. But here are what the verses say. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. For years, 22 years of preaching and probably 20 of those getting this text wrong, I taught this as though it was a 21st century text instead of as though it was part of the Jewish narrative. I hope that by the end of tonight, that that'll make a little bit more sense what I mean by treating the Bible as a Jewish narrative instead of a 21st century text, instead of the, as though, because we tend to read this, here, here's how this tends to sound. We get up, we read this, and we're like, all right, what is God saying to us? What's Jesus saying to us? And what I would do is I would get up in front of a group of 
theoretical Christians, you know, I don't know everybody's heart, but I was preaching to people that I was assuming had put their faith in Jesus most of the time. And I would say, you are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. I'd skip past that part and I'd hurry down to verse 16 where it was said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who's in heaven. And that would become the point that I would make. Live such godly lives, do such good works that people will see your good works and glorify your father who's in heaven. But there's a problem that I never addressed and the problem that I never addressed is if you don't live that way, you're worthless. That's essentially what the text says. Another, the parallel text says that you're good for nothing except for the manure heap. That if salt becomes useless, how can it be made salty again? Here's the proposition of the text. Salt that is no longer salty is worthless. That's, that's what the text is presenting. Everybody agree with that? Salt that is no longer salty, salt that loses its saltiness has no value. And if I teach this as a text that Jesus is saying to Christians then the inevitable conclusion that we come to is if you're living for Christ, but at some point you decide to not live for Christ anymore, you have no value and you should be thrown to the manure heap. That's the inevitable conclusion we have to come to. And then I say, and you're the light of the world. But no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket, but they sit on a lampstand who gives light to all who are in the house. And then we say, some of you are hiding your light. And then, if we're really good preachers, you know, trying to pull the emotional strings, we're like, do you remember that, that song we sang as a kid? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. And then we, we appeal to people, let your light shine. Quit hiding your light. Are you hiding your light? Don't hide your light. Man, we do all these things. We try to make this text be, work for like this American culture. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Because remember, if you're a worthless light, if you're worthless salt, you're destined for the manure heap. You have no value. That inevitably has to be the message that we teach if we teach that this is Jesus talking to the American culture. It has to be. There is the possibility in this text, if this is Jesus talking to us, there is the possibility in this text for a Christian to be worthless. But if it's part of the Jewish narrative, which it is, we don't have to do all that dancing and gymnastics and bend the text and sculpt it in a different way. The Bible says that salvation is from the Jews. That shouldn't shock any of us. That shouldn't offend any of us. Salvation is not an American thing. It's a Jewish thing. We, as Christians, exalt and worship the Jewish God. There is a God in heaven. The Jews knew him as Yahweh. He chose the people of Israel to be his people, not because they were good, not because they were righteous, not because they were more populous than any other people, but because God set his love on them and determined that they would be his people and that through the Jewish people, salvation would be given to the world, to the entire world. Salvation would be offered through the Jewish people. And years later, a savior came and he was a Jew. And he was raised as a Jew, right? Yes, no, sort of, right? This is true, isn't it? Thank you, appreciate you, yeah. So listen to this. Listen to Jesus at the outset of his ministry, one of his first recorded public sermons. He's been preaching in synagogues for weeks at this point. He's just been run out of a synagogue, was just dragged to the brow of a hill, was just about to be thrown off, except for he passed through their midst. And then he gathers some people around him on a hillside, and this is the message he preaches. And his audience is a Jewish audience, and he says to them, to the Jews, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Think about it for just a minute. No other nation At this point in human history, no other nation was worshiping Yahweh God. There were people from other nations who had come to know God and believe in him, right? Naaman the leper in the Old Testament, the Babylonian uh, magi and wise men that Daniel had grown up with and trained. There were people from other cultures, but there was no other nation serving Yahweh God, right? 
And Jesus says to the Jews, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Why? Because they know the one true God. He's speaking to the Jewish people who know the one true God. You're the salt. You're the light. And if you lose your flavor, if you hide the light under a basket, you're worthless. He's speaking to a Jewish audience about their place in human history. That they are the ones who know that from the Jews the Savior would come. That from the Jews life would be given. That from the Jews salvation would arise on the earth. That from the Jews light would shine into the dark place. That from the Jews righteousness could be given and received. And he's saying to these Jews, you're the light of the world. Not to Christians, to Jews. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. It's not Christian statements, it's Jewish statements. It's why later in chapter 5, he's going to say, uh, he's going to talk about the righteousness of the Pharisees. Unless your righteousness, he says in a few verses in chapter 5, he says, unless your righteousness is greater than the Pharisees, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. Think about it like this for just a moment, okay? The righteousness of the Pharisees as a standard Here's how this text got taught to me a lot as a kid, and here's how I used to teach it. We used to teach that the Pharisees were Christians who had become kind of arrogant, self-loving, kind of proud people. Hey, are you a Pharisee? Don't behave like a Pharisee. We, we used to say that to Christians, and yet John chapter 8, Jesus says to the Pharisees, he says, you do not belong to me. You don't know the Father. He goes, you belong to your father, the devil. It is clear from the scripture, from the way that Jesus taught to the Pharisees, not that the Pharisees were ungodly believers, but that the Pharisees were children of the devil. And so when Jesus says, when Jesus says to these Jews who exalt the Pharisees as the level of righteousness, when he says, unless you're more righteous than the Pharisees, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. The way we have tended to teach that is, be more righteous than the self-righteous Christians. Jesus, and here's how we always soften it, because we have to. Jesus says, and here's what we do. Jesus says that the Pharisees, you don't want to be like the Pharisees. Some of you in here are Pharisees. This is not what I'm saying to you. This is bad preaching. This is treating the Gospels as though it's a 21st century text. And preachers used to say stuff like, quit being a Pharisee. You don't want to be a Pharisee. Don't act like the Pharisee. Guys, if you're a Pharisee, you're damned to hell. If you're a Pharisee, you don't know God. But if you treat the Gospels like a 21st century book instead of a Jewish book, if you treat it like an American book instead of a Jewish book, then inevitably the Pharisees become people who are bad at Christianity instead of what they really are, people who do not believe in God. This is a Jewish book. Look at, if you would, please, Matthew 8. Matthew 8. Beginning in verse 5. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him, and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Simply say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. Another one, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness in the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go, it shall be done just as you have believed. If this is a 21st century text, an American text instead of a Jewish text, it creates all sorts of problems. If it's a Jewish text, it's very easy 21st century text, truly, truly, beginning in verse 10, I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. I say that many will come to me from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness in the place where there's weeping and gnashing of, gnashings of teeth. If we read this as though it's a Christian text, we run into a big problem when it says the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. 
Uh, we're going to see all sorts of people from the east and the west come to Jesus. But the sons of the kingdom, the people who should have known better, they're going to be cast into outer darkness. But this isn't a Western text. This isn't a 21st century text. It's a Jewish text. And this time in the world, in the first century, you have Jews literally scattered throughout the world, speaking different languages, living in different countries, attending different synagogues, um, who are living shoulder to shoulder with Greeks. They're in Asia, they're in Greece, they're in Turkey, they're all over the world. And the mindset was, because when the Babylonian uh, exile ended and the people returned back to Jerusalem, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah tell us this, people cast lots and decided who was going to go live in Jerusalem. And all the people who volunteered to go live in Jerusalem were praised, were given great credit for being the people who were going to go reestablish Jerusalem. And the people who were considered to reestablish Jerusalem were considered to be, like, special or better. Then you had Samaria. If you're looking at the map of Israel, Samaria is on the left side of the map. These were the places where the Jews had intermarried with the Assyrians. And that's Samaria. And they were kind of considered outcasts. They're not pure Jews anymore. And then you've got the Jews that were scattered throughout the whole world. And the mindset of the Pharisees, the mindset of the religious elite in Jerusalem, was that all those people who were Samaritans, or all those Jews who were scattered into the other countries and into the other synagogues were criminal of sorts. They were less than. They weren't holy. They weren't going to be righteous. They weren't observing the correct feast and Jewish traditions. They didn't live in Jerusalem. They were, they, were, uh, they were treated with discrimination. And so now here you have this guy, a centurion soldier, who comes and shows that he has faith in Jesus. And Jesus' statement is a condemnation of Israel. People who want to make the, te uh, the text be a 21st century say, well, we're kind of like Israel. We're kind of, sometimes we don't believe. That's not what Jesus is doing. He is straight up telling them, this foreigner has more faith in me than anyone else I've seen in Israel. Who should have believed in Jesus? Who should have received him and known him and understood who he was? The Jews. And Jesus says, this centurion has more faith in me than any of you. And he goes, and here's what you're going to see, talking to his Jewish audience. You are going to see people come from the east and the west and the south and the north and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you're going to see yourselves cast out. The sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. Here's the crazy part, right? He is talking to the people who are in Jerusalem, who are making offerings, who are offering prayers, who have the, the scriptures uh, between their forehead, who have the long robes, who have the tassels, these people whose righteousness in their own minds is based upon their actions and not by faith in God. And these are the people who are telling the whole rest of, the, of Jerusalem and Israel, we have it down. We know the truth. And Jesus is going, no, you don't. You're sons of the devil. You're going to see people that less than people the people that you believe have no inheritance with you, you're going to see the people in the east and the west and the north and the south think scattered Jews, think Samaritans. You're going to see them come and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but you're going to get cast out. It's a Jewish text. It's a condemnation of the lack of faith of the people, this, the people in Israel. That's what he's doing there. This is not a Christian text. This isn't telling you and I to have more faith. This isn't a condemnation of us. It's Jesus condemning them. In fact, if you go over, to chapter 13. Beginning in verse 10. And the disciples came to Jesus and said, why are you speaking to the people in parables? And Jesus said to you, speaking to the disciples, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdoms of he kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. 
For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, or even what he does have, will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing, but not understand. You will keep on seeing, but not perceive. The disciples come to Jesus one evening after Jesus has preached the whole sermon. All, he's going to preach all of chapter 13 in parables. But they're going to come to him and they're going to say, why are you preaching in parables? And he says, to you guys, the ones that I'm explaining it to every night, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to the rest of them, it has not been given. So that the words of Isaiah could be fulfilled, that they would hear but not understand, that they would see but never perceive. The text of Isaiah that he's quoting there is Isaiah chapter 6. And in Isaiah chapter 6, God laments over Israel, over Jerusalem. And he says of Israel and he says of Jerusalem, he says to them, well, he says, first of all, to Isaiah, he says, who will go and preach my message to the people? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. What do you want me to say to the people? And God says, Isaiah, tell the people, be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. And Isaiah goes, how long, Lord? And he says, until the city is desolate. This is quoted for us in Matthew. This is quoted for us in Mark. John quotes it in John chapter 12, and it's quoted for us in Romans. So John quotes this, Paul quotes this, and Jesus quotes it twice. This text is a Jewish text, that there would be people who wouldn't see, people who wouldn't comprehend that the Savior was right in front of them. And why was that important? Why was it important that the Jews not comprehend who Jesus was? Well, the reason is because if they had understood who he was, they wouldn't have crucified him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8 says, if they had understood that he was the Lord of glory, they never would have crucified him. Their eyes were, were blinded and their ears were left deaf so that they would not understand who he was, so that they would put him to death. It's a Jewish text. I cannot tell you how many times growing up I have heard preachers say, the reason we preach in parables is because Jesus preached in parables, because Jesus wanted his message to be understood by the common people. Jesus didn't preach in parables so that the message would be understood. The exact opposite is what Jesus says. I preach in parables so they won't understand. Think about this for just a minute. This really ticks me off. Let me just, if you will, get on my soapbox for just a moment. It ticks me off that we have preachers, and that I believed them, but we have preachers who say we should speak in parables just like Jesus did because Jesus did it to be understood. It ticks me off because there are three very clear texts where Jesus specifically answers the question of why he spoke in parables, and in every case he says, so that they will not understand. So either we have people who are so ignorant of the Bible that they have no idea what they're doing, or we have people who know that that's what the Bible says and chooses to ignore it because they are better at telling fictional stories than they are telling the gospel of Jesus. Either way, it pisses me off. Know your Bible and teach the truth of it. Off the soapbox. This, this is a Jewish text. It deals with Jewish issues. We have to understand it in light of that. You and I don't find it offensive that Jesus said, these people that you don't like are going to dine with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We don't find it offensive because most of us have been raised in a Christian culture and we identify ourselves with Abraham. But it ticked off the Jews because they said, we're the only good ones. They put so much stock in their lineage back to Abraham that they couldn't imagine that people outside of that might have a place with God. It's a Jewish text. Look over, if you would, in John 12. I think that's right. Hold on. We can go there, and if it's not right, we'll go somewhere else. All right, pick up with me. Uh, I don't know, I I keep wanting to go back and start further and further back. So let's just start in John 12, 27. 
This is the, the day that Jesus is going to be arrested. Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it's for this reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered and others were saying an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world and the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. By this, he was saying to indicate the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd then answered him, we have heard of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. How can you say that the son of man must be lifted up? Who is the son of man? And Jesus said, for a little while longer, the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that darkness will not overtake you. But he who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you can become sons of light. Let's just pause and think, how do we teach this if we pretend it's a 21st century text? For a little while longer, you have the son of light with you. Walk in the light. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you can become sons of light. The day before he's crucified, while you have the light, walk in the light. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you can become sons of light. This is a Jewish text. How does this play out if we teach it as an American text? Listen, while you have the chance, you still have the chance. Jesus hasn't come back yet. While we still have the light, walk in the light so that you can become sons of light. We make it an evangelistic text. It's an evangelistic text, but it's a very short-lived one. Jesus is dying in less than 24 hours. Believe me, he's saying. Believe me. Recognize who I am. They say, we've heard it said in the law that the Savior will remain forever. Speaking to that. Matthew 5, Matthew 6, you've heard it said in the law. You've heard it said in the law. You've heard it said in the law, but then Jesus says, but I say to you, listen, the only reason any of us know anything about the biblical law is because we've read it. None of us in here, to my knowledge, are Jewish. Jesus was talking to Jews who knew the law, who understood it, and he was undermining their view of it. Think about the prodigal son. One of the most famous stories, most often preached stories in the Bible, Luke 15. Nuts and bolts of the story are this. There was a father who had two sons. The older son, the younger son, because that's how it works, you know. And the younger son came to the father and said, give me my inheritance, I'm done. So the father divides the inheritance between the two boys. The younger son leaves with his inheritance and he goes and he squanders all of his money on reckless living, and he gets to the point where he's so destitute, he is feeding pigs, and he's longing to feed himself, to stuff his belly with even the pods that he's giving to the pigs. And he sits there and he says, my father has many servants who are well-fed and well-taken care of, and here I am in this squalor with the pigs. I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna repent, and I'm gonna ask my father to make me like one of his servants. And he goes home, and he confronts his father, and his father runs out, and he embraces him, and he puts a ring on his finger, and he clothes him, and he throws a big party for him, and he's so pleased to have him back. And then the older brother comes in from the field, and he goes, what's going on? And somebody says, your brother has come back, and they're throwing a party for him. And the older brother is ticked off. And the older brother, eventually the father comes out to him and he goes, what's wrong? And he goes, he, he went off and squandered everything you gave him with loose living. Meanwhile, I'm here and you haven't even given me so much as a goat to have a party with my friends. And he goes, and you're honoring him? And the father says, isn't it right for me to do with my stuff what I want to do with my stuff? I haven't been unfair to you. He goes, everything I have is yours. He goes, but this son was dead and is alive. This son was lost and is found. We read that text, and if we treat it like a 21st century text, as though Jesus is talking directly to American Christians instead of Jesus talking to Jews, it gets very convoluted really quickly. We make it an evangelistic text again. We make the brother at home. I don't know what we make him. It depends on the preacher that you're talking to, I suppose. But we make him all these different kinds of things. We try to make the text work. It's a Jewish text. There's a couple of really obvious clues in it. One of which is that he's feeding pigs. That's a really obvious clue that it's a Jewish text. Jews were forbidden 
from raising pigs, eating pigs, being around pigs. It was forbidden as a Jewish custom. I would imagine that it wouldn't be out. I mean, I don't personally know any. Oh, I do. I personally know a pig farmer. I had to think about it for a second. I personally know a pig farmer. Anybody else know a pig farmer? Just me. Okay. Yeah, you? Yeah. So there's two of us that know pig farmers. Three? Nice. Three of us that know pig farmers. The people that I know doing okay at it. They make a living at it. He's able to support his family, his wife, and his four kids, paying his mortgage, right? We don't look at it as a profane job. But if you're a Jew, you look at it as profane. To be throwing slop for the pigs is like degrading and low. Does that make sense? It's a Jewish mindset. And what you need to do is you need to remember first century. You need to remember that there are the people who believe that they were entitled to the grace and the mercy of God. Think Pharisees, think older brother. When you think older brother, think Pharisees. Think people who lived in Israel, who said of themselves, I've always done the right thing. I've always done what I was supposed to do. And then the younger brother, think Samaritans. Think Jews who stayed in Asia. Think Jews who stayed in Greece. Think Jews who stayed in Turkey. Blending their lives with the, the lives of the Gentiles. And, the old, and then they're starting to come back. What were the Pharisees so ticked off about? that Jesus was talking with sinners and tax collectors. The sinners that he was talking to were the the peripheral people, the people out on the edge. And Jesus says of those people, he goes, you will see these people come into heaven long before you do. These are the people who know me. These are the people who believe in me. It's a Jewish dialogue. It's a big backhand in the face of the people who believed that they were entitled to righteousness just because of the actions that they lived rather than their faith. It's a Jewish text. Please do yourself this one favor. It's not doing me a favor. I I, I hope and we hope as as pastors and I hope as your teaching pastor, I, I hope to lead you into the truth of Scripture. And I will gladly, anytime that you bring it to me or anytime that I realize it in my own study that I have taught something wrong, I will gladly make it right. Gladly. Those of you who have walked with us for years have heard me do that multiple times. I want to hold to the truth of the scripture. So when I say what I'm about to say, it's not you doing me a favor, it's you doing yourself a favor. Do yourself the favor that when you read the scripture, you ask simple questions of yourself. Who wrote it? Who are they talking to? What are they trying to say? Because the gospels are not Christian texts. They're Jewish texts that have great significance for us who have put faith in Jesus. Isaiah is not written for me. Isaiah was written for rebellious Israel. But it shows me, a 21st century believer, the character of the God that I serve. It gives me insight into who he was. We're so worried that if we make Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John Jewish texts, we're so worried that none of us will know how to live. We won't possibly know what to do. I mean, how great is it that Matthew 5, uh, here, how great, very sarcastically, dripping with sarcasm, how great is it that Matthew 5 tells us if you go to leave your gift before the altar and you remember that a brother has something against you, go and make it right with your brother so that your gift can be accepted. How great does that preach in 21st century? How many of you came in here today and your heart wasn't right? You're trying to offer God a gift of your worship. You're trying to proclaim to God, his great worth. But if you have a brother that is offended, you need to leave your gift here at the altar and go and make it right. Otherwise, God hates your gift. That's how we teach it. It's wrong. It's completely wrong. It's a Jewish text. The Jews were walking into the synagogues. The Jews were making offerings. And the Jews, the brotherly division that's happening here is between the Pharisees and the Samaritans, the Pharisees and the Jews from Asia. This break in the nation of God that was supposed to be the salt and the light, indicating that the Savior had come. Because you and I don't bring our gifts before an altar. 
And you and I don't cause our gifts to be holy because of an altar. And you and I aren't acceptable because we've gotten right what was once wrong with a brother. Every gift we have to lay before the feet of the Father is because of the Father's work. And we are acceptable because of who Jesus is, not because of who we are. These are Jewish texts that must be understood in light of Jewish history. And you know what's so beautiful about them? Is that we, who are these peripheral people, Gentiles, looped in by the grace of God, can read the documented history of a Jewish God, not that God is Jewish, but he is the God of the Jews. We can read the documented history of it, we can read his character, and we can read his nature, and we can say, we have been invited to worship the one God, the one Lord, the one King. We have been invited into the narrative. We have been invited into the story that the God that Israel has known for thousands of the years, of years, we have come to know. And we have put all of our faith in him. And the savior that he promised, he sent. And through him, through Jesus, we have been reconciled to God. And that's how we read the text. The revelation of God, the revelation of his work. And it shapes everything we believe and know. Let's pray. Lord God, I wasted um, a lot of years teaching a very self-centered, very American view of the Bible. And I misrepresented you a lot. And I poorly equipped people to know you a lot. And I'm very, very grateful that ultimately I'm not the teacher but the Holy Spirit is. But God, unless you come back or unless you take me home soon, I've got a lot more years of teaching ahead. So let what is spoken in this place here at the 456, let what is spoken be true. Let what is spoken be grounded in the truth of the scripture. May I never, Lord, seek to make it fit some expectation that I have or some intent that I have. May my only aim be to unfold the pages of the scripture and make you known in them. Guard this church. Guard these people. May we be careful students of your word, not so that we can puff out our chest or boast in ourselves, but so that we can rightly handle the word of truth. So that we won't misrepresent you in our hearts or the statements that we make in passing to other people. Way heavy on us, the responsibility of handling your word well, especially with me, Lord. Let there be Just a heavy sense of responsibility anytime any one of us would open our mouths to say, thus says the Lord. And I thank you, God, that you included us Gentiles in the story. I thank you that we have come to know Yahweh, the God of the Jews, the God who has poured out his love and his mercy 
on all the nations through Jesus Christ. And we proclaim that you are alone the one true God. And that in you alone are we made whole and righteous and complete. In you alone are we forgiven. God, I pray, I pray that as long as the 456 is a group of people, a church of people proclaiming your worth, I pray, Lord, that you would guard us and that we would proclaim rightly who you are. Not for our glory, not for our accolade, but for yours. It is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray now. Amen.